Giovanni, we can hear you well. If all the other speakers could switch the microphone off, the floor is over to you, Giovanni. Gregoire, and again, welcome to all participants to the second part of this event for the official launch of the European Commission Knowledge Center for Biodiversity. Before starting this session, giving the floor to Umberto, let me simply remind you, first of all, as now Gregoire repeated, that you should mute your mic not during the session, unless that you are invited to speak. And let me also thank again our Commission for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, Virginia Sinkevicius, and Maria Gabriel, Commissioner for Innovation, Culture, Research, Education, Youth, for opening this event. Now, I would also like to acknowledge and to thank also the JSC Director General Stephen Quest and the Deputy Director General DG Environment, Joanna Drake, for managing, facilitating the first session, and also for their support in helping us to set up the Knowledge Center Biodiversity. I think it was very much important to receive this clear support from hierarchy, you know, that we were going in the right direction. So thank you again very much, Steve and Joanna. And I would not, I would now like to pass over to Umberto, please. Thank you, Giovanni. I hope you all hear me well. Let me just say that you have heard from the previous session that the European Commission has launched this Knowledge Center for Biodiversity as announced in the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030. So one of the first deliverables, it will be hosted by the JRC, which is the European Commission's in-house science service, and its contents is to be co-developed with the European Environmental Agency. So, acting as a one-stop shop for policymakers, main objectives to provide easy access to the indicators used for tracking and assessing progress on the commitments made in the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, to foster cooperation and partnership between experts and decision makers at the EU and the international level, and to support biodiversity policy implementation monitoring, reporting, and review. Over to you, Giovanni. Umberto, thanks a lot. And now we go ahead because we know we want to further discuss the challenges associated to reverting biodiversity loss through science and policies. So we invited six, six distinguished speakers from both sides, science and policy. So these speakers are the following. John Bell, director at the RTD, Carla Montesi, director at DEFCO, Ronan Uel, scientific advisor for the executive director of EEA, so the Environment Agency. Jen, Jane Smart is the global director of the International Union for, Conven for Conservation of Nature. Colli Pretorius, deputy director of UNEP, World Conservation Monitoring System uh, Center, and finally Mark Abadi, who is the chairman of the biodiversity at the Chess, the Depot, and Conciliation. So I think that we will have first. I would like to give the floor to all of them for about thirty minutes, inviting the speakers to answer to the question in less than five minutes. So Umberto and myself will we we raise specific question to the distinguished speakers and then I would like to have time enough to open the floor to the public so that we can really go to an open question and answer time. So I would like now to again hand over to you Umberto for the very first question to Carla. Uh, I've actually will start if you agree with John Bell. Uh, I hope you're there, John, and you listen to me. So the question for you is, uh, science is meant to play quite a key role in the monitoring, reporting, and reviewing of the post-2020 biodiversity policy, and I mean both intra-EU and global. Now tell us, please, what are the main priorities and challenges for DGRTD to support it, and how could the Knowledge Center help? Over to you, John. Umberto, hi Giovanni. I hope that our scientific underpinning of this event is catching me on screen. Um, very straightforwardly, I think we need to get biodiversity and the science underpinning it 
um, from the analysis and the, the monitoring to the observation, the prediction and the solutions. We need to get it to where the IPCC is now in terms of climate. We need to have an underpinning sy system of science that can actually help in terms of all of the different elements in terms of monitoring, reporting, implementation and corrective action. We need a long-term strategic research agenda for biodiversity to deal with what we see is happening, what we learn is happening, and what needs to be done about it. We need to strengthen the links between science and policy, providing uh, uh, access to that science and information in a way that decision makers can use it. And I think the Knowledge Centre for the Biodiversity, which is a great moment for us today, can be the beginning of what we propose in Horizon Europe as a new science service, where we need to be able to provide to people who are going to have to make very big policy decisions on a scale that we haven't known before in real places, in different situations around Europe, they're going to need support in doing that. Um, I think also we know um, that we, we've tried to see if we can actually mainstream the work that's going on uh, to prevent biodiversity loss, to monitor, to improve, to restore and regenerate uh, in the work of the research innovation program. So the end of Horizon 2020, we've seen the Green Deal call, which is seeking to have breakthroughs in, in moving this transition forward looking at issues of upscale restoration of systems uh, in research and demonstration activities. So I think also in terms of what can we do to prevent, improve uh, and, and, and regenerate will be critical to demonstrate, to deploy, to test solutions at scale to some of the problems that we're seeing. Uh, and last but not least, we need to mobilize and align different actors uh, across uh, science, research and innovation uh, to deploy the kind of building up of knowledge, the dissemination of knowledge, but also the solutions that need to be tested and demonstrated at scale across all of Europe and our partners. So in that, we'll be building a new partnership for biodiversity, building on the great work done by biodiversity in the past to link up with all the different parts of the research policy and civic engagement uh, establishments to, to start to prepare this transition towards living within our planetary boundaries. And last but not least, we are launching these four Green Deal missions, which have been uh, announced two weeks ago at the Research and Innovation Days. And biodiversity plays a central role, in fact, in three of the four missions. In the mission to deal with the restoration of the soil system, the huge direct uh, challenges that we've seen to the cause of biodiversity loss will be addressed as we restore soil and move to a post-chemical pesticide-based future and sounder nutrient cycles. In the oceans and healthy oceans and, and waters by 2030 mission, uh, which are moonshot ideas where we bring research innovation to fundamentally transform big problems that we face. Um, there are large amounts of regeneration of river systems, uh, coastal systems, wetland systems, which are critical uh, to biodiversity, indeed to climate change. Uh, and in the climate adaptation mission, where we're looking at very significant changes, risks and threats uh, to biodiversity, but also to, to society, we're going to have to use restoration, regeneration as a key way of building back better uh, resilience in our society, in our regions, our cities, coastlands, uh, to deal with the weather that's coming. So there's a lot to do. Uh, and it's a very, very, very good to see that we're getting, we're getting started uh, and we're starting to deliver on the promise of the biodiversity strategy. And I thank Umberto and Giovanni and our colleagues for such a promising start. Thank you. Up. Uh, I can now go ahead, if you agree, Umberto, raising the question to Carla then. So, Carla, looking at the worldwide dimension, so outside Europe, you know that biodiversity hotspots are mainly found outside of the EU while affected by EU consumers. So what are, from your perspective, you know, the main challenges you know, regarding the use and access to knowledge on biodiversity and ecosystems? Thank you, thank you. Many thanks to Giovanni and, uh, and Umberto. And uh, let me say that, uh, are you hearing me? Hello? Are you hearing me? Do you hear you? 
Perfect. Sorry, <laughs> I have the, the doubt. Okay, let let me start by saying that uh, I'm very happy to participate to the Green Week, and let me start by congratulate our commissioner for the creation of this uh, knowledge center on, on biodiversity. Absolutely, as you mentioned, it's really very relevant for all our action. Uh, you just mentioned that when we look to the Green Deal, when we look to the biodiversity, we are facing global challenges. And uh, this implies that, of course, everything that we will do, we will have also to do with our partner countries. When we see the bulk, the bulk of the biodiversity on health, it's contained in the tropical countries, where healthy ecosystems are essential for the livelihood of hundreds of millions of poor people. And this is the reason why we are saying, looking to the Green Deal, clearly the Green Deal will be the blueprint of our external action. So really, we want absolutely to be part of this initiative. We want to use this initiative. Um, of course, you just mentioned when we need to base our policies, our action on solid information. Solid information that has to be relevant also for the local needs, uh, for the local capacity. So we will need to have, of course, data to cope for the comprehensive strategy uh, and there to establish a real link between the science and the practitioner, but we will need also to have clear data also at the local country by country level. Now, when uh, you know very well that we are in a particular moment where we are launching the new uh, financial instrument, the new cooperation with our partner countries for the period 2021-2027, we really want to work. We are in the moment of the pre-programming. We are in the moment where we have to establish the priorities of our development cooperation, international cooperation with our partner countries. And this means that we have to identify priorities and the action uh, with our partner. And uh, uh, of course, in dealing with this, really the Green Deal and the biodiversity will be between the main priorities. And the saying that, this implies that we we'll want to launch initiative in this domain. And uh, uh, we are already starting with our partner countries to look to some what we are calling the Team Europe Initiative, so not just the European institution, but the European institution plus member states plus the financial institution. And in between all this initiative, we have a strong dimension on biodiversity and the natural resources. This implies that our delegation will need now uh, come very soon with the preparation of action and the 40s, they will need a solid information on the status, on the trends of biodiversity at country level, at regional level. Uh, and this will be absolutely uh, required in order that we'll be able to identify future program and also to support the policy of our partner countries. So just what I want to underline on this, that this knowledge center, of course, will be really interesting and very important to have the information that is required at the global level. So uh, to, to just go in the negotiation with the global authors, let me just mention the, CB, the CBD work. But of course, in our spirit, this knowledge center has also to be an essential tool for implementing our future policy, our future partnership on biodiversity at the national and the local level. And so all these data are the data that will allow us to, us to establish frank policy dialogue with our partner countries that will allow us to identify clearly action of, uh, of intervention. So really very, very important to have this analysis, this data, just to be able to define, implement, monitoring, innovative program on environment and climate change. Um, maybe I 
add just uh, one element that when we look to the various uh, to the, the 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 kind of information that we will need, uh, we I can identify various domain of biodiversity. Of course, uh, will be information for the conservation, sustainable use, and restoration of high biodiversity ecosystem. Uh, let's look to the forest, the ocean, the wetlands. But of course, we need also information about uh, the wildlife issue, the sustainable use of uh, biodiversity uh, products, uh, fight against wildlife trafficking. And third point, I would say, uh, was already mentioned, it's the mainstreaming of uh, biodiversity in all of development sectors. So look into biodiversity in the energy, agriculture, fisheries sector. So the, for me, this uh, knowledge center should have uh, a really ambitious and broad mandate. I don't want to scare you, but I think that uh, will be really, really very important uh, for us to, to, to build our cooperation, our future cooperation with our partners. Of course, I cannot say that we, we uh, move from nothing because as you know very well, we have also from now relevant uh, programs that help us and will help you also on on having this information. Let me just mention, for example, the Observatoire de Forêt d'Afrique Centrale. So we are from now already financing a project and the program that will allow us to collect the data. But I think all this information could be really exploited uh, by the by the um, knowledge center on biodiversity. We can build on this. We have also the BioPAM uh, program that, uh, uh, of course, uh, provide a fantastic overview, a uh, fantastic opportunities for the Knowledge Center um, to work with the African, Caribbean and the Pacific countries. So a lot of expectation, let me say, uh, it is important for, 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 for us in all this and we'll be very happy to work with this Knowledge Center to contribute to the steering of this excellent initiative and uh, uh, of course uh, really be uh, very happy to contribute to the work of this Knowledge Center. Many thanks and over to you. To you, Carla, for putting in evidence the potential of the Center for the External International Development, Development Cooperation uh, from the knowledge angle. And I will follow up with a question to Jane, Jane Smart, which is IUCN is for long providing key knowledge tools for biodiversity. Just as an example, the IUCN red lists of threatened species and their ecosystems, etc. So please tell us what are the main obstacles and challenges to their effective use by policymakers, and how could this knowledge center contribute to their better uptake? Up to you, Jane. Good morning, colleagues, and thank you very much indeed for the introduction to this very exciting panel event. And many congratulations on, on the launch of the Knowledge Center. So just a word first on the IUCN Red List. I think as many of you no, the IUCN Red List is the world's most comprehensive information source on the global status of species, and that's animals, fungi and plants. And given that we must really urgently address the global biodiversity crisis, such an information source is clearly critical. And I want to point out that the Red List is way more than a list of names and threat categories. For every species assessed, we have information on not only the threats, but the actual action that can be taken. And critically, every single species on there has a list, a, a map, I apologize, a map. Um, and any big challenge, as we say, requires really good intelligence. And the Red List gives us this for species to support the action that must be taken. And it is essential, obviously, that we measure progress towards meeting the targets in the EU biodiversity strategy for 2013. And the Red List can do this through the Red List Index, which is an official indicator already uh, to measure progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals and indeed the IHU targets. This allows genuine changes in threat categories of species to be measured and monitored. For instance, if as a result of conservation action, the status of a species improves, then the Red List Index can show this. 
In the same way, it also shows us, indeed already is showing us, when such action is not being taken um, to conserve biodiversity. Now, in an exciting new initiative, the Red List is also the basis for the establishment of what we're calling science-based targets um, for biodiversity at the species level. And these allow any specific actor to understand and then undertake specific actions in specific places um, to deliver action towards delivering the species elements of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So a very critical tool uh, moving forward that could play a big role here. And we also are currently bringing together the Red List with the World Database on Protected Areas and the World Database of Key Biodiversity Areas through IBAT, which is jointly managed by IUCN with UNEP WCMC, BirdLife International and Conservation International to inform decision making in both the private and the public sectors. So, as I say, we very much welcome the establishment of this new knowledge centre and it is wonderful that it will support the EU biodiversity strategy. But we really do feel that these services need to be extended now to the whole globe so that global data sets such as the Red List, such as the World Database on Protected Areas and Key Biodiversity Areas can support the implementation of the full post 2020 framework. Providing such a facility and matching the relevant data sets together with the key users should have huge benefits, I think, in terms of resource efficiency. There are so many platforms springing up all over the place and we really need to pull everything together. And such innovation should really lead to greater investment in these easy to use platforms than any one institution can possibly do by itself. And hopefully that in turn will lead to greater communication of the need to take action and greater accountability of those taking such action. Just a final point to finish on, um, IUCN really does believe that the post-2020 global biodiversity framework needs to be a framework for all. So in addition to the CBD, the Knowledge Centre should also be of use to the other two Rio conventions and the other biodiversity related conventions. I mean Ramsar, CITES and the Convention on Migratory Species. This will make for greater efficiencies at national level and improve messaging around the need to take action by all parts of government, which just leads us on to effective mainstreaming, something I think we all want to see. Of course, there are many details to be sorted out. The governance arrangements will require quite a lot of homework, I think, and careful thought. But overall, thank you. We very much welcome this initiative and um, very much hope that we can be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane for stressing again once more the global dimension, the relevance to extend our study to, and to involve also the global uh, issues. But, and you go also to remind us how many organizations should be involved and we will get profit from the very first kickoff meeting to understand how we can involve all these organizations besides CBD. But now after two, speakers talking about the global dimension would like to go back to the European dimension. Therefore, I would like to raise the question to Roland Ewell, so from the Environment Agency. And you know that, of course, this agency is a key provider, as we said already during the first part of the meeting, <coughs> of information on European biodiversity by collecting data from member states and transforming this into information to support policy and decision making. This is very obvious and very clear. So to, 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 to your understanding, to your, let's say, knowledge, what are therefore the key areas of the science policy interface that should be now put in priority, so should be now early improved, and now maybe the support can come, you now in the, become more effective via the knowledge center, please. Ronan, can you hear us? We do not hear you.
Giovanni, if we've lost Ronan, maybe we could launch another question to another panelist and we try to catch up with Ronan. What do you say? Of course, yes. Uh, okay. Then a question to Mark, Mark Abadi, which would be the following, Mark. Uh, transformative changes will be key to revert biodiversity loss. So tell us, please, your views on the role of the industry and business in this process and how can such a knowledge center for biodiversity best support business needs? Over to you, Mark, please. Thank you very much. I, I hope you hear me. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm very glad to be part of the, this panel. I think that for the businesses, industry, and the financial sector, what we need is a correct, sure, pragmatic and concrete information about uh, what are our footprint on biodiversity. And to, to succeed for the new uh, Green Deal and the new European strategy for 2030 or to the new CBD, I think that uh, there is a lot of weight from uh, CEO and the financial sector to have the tools to be sure to have a good action on biodiversity and to restore it in many cases. So it is not very easy and that's why I think that the new central knowledge for on biodiversity you are launching is a very, very good opportunity. It was needed because in each state, I think, in many states, I think, of the European Union, you can find agency who are working on it, but uh, uh, I don't think there is enough exchange between the scientists, uh, the NGOs, and the businesses and the financial sector, and this center could be a place to exchange uh, what we need on the business part and what you are offering and what you can do on the scientific part. And I think it is mandatory to mainstream biodiversity all across the sector uh, in economy. And also because we need uh, a global view of it. All along the supply chain for our subcontractors, we need to have information what they are doing, where the materials come from, the raw materials especially, and also what are the planning uh, issues from the municipality of the or the regional powers. For France, it is obvious that it is a key problem. So the data we need, we have to build it because some of them are not existing and uh, we must uh, act quickly. Uh, just an example for us. As Umberto knows and many of, the, of you, maybe, we are working on, on global footprint scoring and what we, one, our main support, what uh, the Dutch Environment Public Agency, PBL, was doing with uh, MSA per kilo, kilometer square. It was very important to find that tool, all this data, because we can use it, work with the factory to have a good view of what they are doing about biodiversity in uh, uh, many, many factories, things it is a, a good reference to use. So what we are waiting from the new Knowledge Center on Biodiversity, which is, uh, I repeat, it is a very, very good uh, initiative, is to exchange data, to exchange method of work, to exchange uh, priority, and then to monitor it, all of the process all along the supply chain, and to have a, a solid information for our stakeholder and shareholder too, that's obvious, and also to have the tools to react, to do so what we are doing differently 
to be sure that uh, the consequences on biodiversity are better than before. That's, I think, what we are waiting for in the businesses and for the financial sector, because the CDC is first a public institution for financing. We need information to be sure that the information that coming to us is uh, real, it is objective, and it is uh, shared by all the st st stakeholders, and we can compare benchmark, as we say in France, uh, because it is uh, very important that all the people in Europe use some standards well recognized by everyone. That's my contribution, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, indeed. I, I agree entirely with your urgency request for making a step ahead in addressing these urgent needs. Now, my question is simply whether Ronan is with us now or not. Ronan, can you hear us? Apparently not. So then I would immediately go to Corley because I think that what I do like to raise the questions, the following, you know that we have forthcoming COP15 on the Convention of Biological Diversity. So my logic question to you, how you can suggest us how you, we can scale up our efforts in the Nordic Center for Biodiversity uh, to support the forthcoming global biodiversity strategy. So I can make the link which was already suggested by Carla, but also what do you suggest can we do to better extend our efforts to the, to the global dimension? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni and Roberto, also for the invitation to participate um, in this panel discussion today. To answer your question, there are several ways how the EU and its member states can support the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. Um, and I will, I appreciate that I might um, um, repeat some of the other points that's been made by my uh, the other speakers on this panel. I think firstly, it's important to appreciate that it's a, it is a framework that requires all sectors of society to contribute to the biodiversity agenda and also to understand how their actions also support the achievement of other environmental um, agreements and the SDGs. We anticipate that the public and private decision, sector decision making in the non-environment sectors in particular, such as economic development, trade, finance, supply chains, Mark has uh, alluded to uh, agriculture and minerals and materials, will have a much greater need to understand their impacts, dependencies and opportunities related to biodiversity and ecosystem services. And taking all these efforts together, and to echo John's uh, intervention, the first intervention, we need to develop an improved understanding of the sum of these commitments being made by countries and other stakeholders to know whether the level of ambition is sufficient to delivering the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. Secondly, as uh, is very clear from the session today and, and the purpose of, of what we are discussing with this the centre, access to reliable and trusted data and information will be key to inform decisions at all levels, global, regional, national, subnational, within public organizations, but also within uh, the private sector. It is useful to further note that governments need such access, not only with regards to implementation of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework itself, but also its implementation in the context of other global imperatives, such as the post COVID recovery, their own socioeconomic development needs, and of course, climate change. Thirdly, the EU and its member states have already played a magnificent leadership role in investing in the development and use of indicators and its, in its support to parties to the biodiversity related conventions with tools and platforms to increase the efficiency of reporting and lower that the, the burden of, of getting the information together. 
It could continue this leadership role by investing in the underlying data and decision support system that could help its members, its economic actors, but also its development partners to understand environmental change, to value the contribution of biodiversity to so many different socioeconomic systems, as well as to monitor and report on progress on the implementation of the global biodiversity uh, framework. Strengthening the knowledge management for global biodiversity will also greatly enhance the ability of public and private sector actors to integrate nature across the SDGs, driving that long um, sought after mainstreaming agenda that can set us on the pathway to sustainability. Accessible and reliable data, information, knowledge could support assessments and all, at all levels so it's not only for monitoring, but it also informs planning and review at the um, national level and helping us to get a, a global picture of these uh, developments. Finally, strengthened accountability for the global biodiversity framework will depend on strengthened national level capacity for implementation, monitoring, reporting, review. Such strengthened national monitoring systems will be a requirement if the so-called headline indicators are to be adopted as part of the global biodiversity framework. And the intention there is that all parties would report against these headline indicators in a consistent manner. We are a long way from such systems in many countries at the moment, and they need to be supported with financing and technical support, building on existing experiences in the use of biodiversity indicators at the global and the national level, have a clear understanding on how such systems could be linked to existing national uh, monitoring and reporting mechanisms, including the, through the National Statistics Office and national environmental accounts. And then the final, final point is that these systems, monitoring systems are really required early in the next um, decade. This is a major lesson that we've learned from the last uh, decade of the biodiversity strategy. And for us to, to really monitor progress in a meaningful way against the 2030 action targets. And this will in, help us to have a much clearer understanding of how the global uh, picture is coming together and global pro process um, to address our biodiversity um, challenge. So work could and should therefore start now to ensure that such systems are getting up and running in parallel with the development and the adoption of the political process around the global biodiversity framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, because you really showed how much knowledge is needed internationally and how much the centre can contribute. I now think we do have Ronan Uel with us. So to you, Ronan, uh, we all know, we've heard also from Hans, how DEA is a key provider of information on biodiversity in Europe. It collects data from member states, developing indicators and assessments, supporting our EU policy and decision making. And you yourself have been pretty much involved in that. So please tell us what are the key knowledge gaps that should be filled and how the centre could help filling these gaps, according to you. To you, Rona. Umberto, uh, thank you, Giovanni. Um, the fact that you have called on this panel, I think, is uh, also indicating that uh, the Knowledge uh, Biodiversity Center is very much this platform for many collaborations uh, that we will have to sort of uh, pursue. And uh, this is exactly what is at the core of uh, knowledge developments. We we'll have to work, uh, many of us uh, together, uh, to really fill uh, the knowledge gaps. And rather than uh, to speak to speak of knowledge gaps, I would like to speak of uh, knowledge requirements, uh, because uh, my main uh, kind of uh, uh, plea is really to recognise that uh, uh, the biodiversity uh, strategy for 2030 by the EU is the one uh, which is definitely indicating uh, which requirements, which knowledge requirements would be necessary to indeed uh, uh, monitor, review and uh, uh, really verify somehow uh, that uh, uh, we are having an effect on the ground uh, thanks to this uh, new policy uh, uh, intervention. So in that regard, 
a, a very, very specific read of the biodiversity strategy will indicate very simply, very directly, uh, where we will need to put the focus in terms of uh, new information flows, new data flows, new knowledge developments. And I would like to name three uh, uh, as uh, uh, examples of where we need to put uh, the focus and uh, uh, really regain some, uh, I would say, collaborations uh, to secure that we will deliver uh, uh, on the ground. One has a lot to do with uh, uh, what is already in place when it comes to informing on the state of nature. Uh, 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 during Green Week, uh, the state of nature 2020 has been presented. It's based on uh, many, many uh, data flows that are really worked out uh, with uh, the countries. More than 2,000, 200,000 uh, 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 volunteers on the ground collecting and observing and uh, being this kind of monitoring scheme that we need uh, to report on the state of nature. Now, the challenge with uh, the uh, strategy is to say, yeah, but it's not enough because we do that on uh, uh, selected habitats, we do that on selected species. And uh, uh, what we are asked is to really work on uh, a better ecological coherence overall. This is what the strategy is requiring. So what does it mean for reporting data and uh, all the monitoring schemes put in place under the uh, water legislation, the marine legislation, under uh, 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 the agriculture legislation? How are we going to fill the gap of uh, soil uh, uh, monitoring in that regard? So we need to go for some streamlining uh, uh, of uh, uh, reporting as we know it in the EU, uh, and that will contribute very much also to the better regulation agenda. So uh, uh, data requirements uh, for reporting uh, uh, obligations will be one where we would need to sort of uh, uh, reinvent uh, uh, more clearly what we mean by uh, uh, good ecological status, for instance. Uh, so what are the parameters that we need to sort of uh, uh, observe and measure on the ground uh, uh, in a very, very integrated uh, monitoring approach? Um, so one domain is definitely uh, when it comes to the EU reporting, we need to organize uh, for uh, 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 better uh, uh, complementarities and uh, full coherence with uh, uh, all the actors in the member states uh, what is at stake here is to say that uh, uh, we want indeed uh, integrated monitoring across uh, uh, marine, freshwater, terrestrial uh, 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 ecosystems and uh, uh, biodiversity components. The second example, I think, is uh, very much represented by uh, the uh, restoration plan or uh, 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 the uh, uh, effectiveness of uh, um, protection uh, at the EU level. Uh, in that regard, uh, it is absolutely clear that uh, uh, what is at stake here is uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, connectivity, for instance, uh, uh, of uh, projected areas. How do we measure? How do we define? How do we place connectivity? Uh, uh, so everything we are doing right now in terms of uh, informing, mapping ecosystem, assessing ecosystems, uh, uh, through their extent, through their conditions, uh, 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 through their services, etc. How do we really manage to really uh, uh, identify what is indeed coherent uh, towards uh, uh, a sort of uh, ecological connectivity, uh, uh, so to respond uh, to restoration targets? This is a big domain, and I think John Byrne has been very explicit about uh, uh, how we need to activate uh, uh, better science and better research to help on uh, ecological monitoring. So that's another domain where we know we have a, 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 a set of huge efforts uh, to produce, uh, 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 to be on par with uh, uh, the requirements. And this is where knowledge, uh, uh, we find indeed uh, uh, a good reasoning to say, if we have so specific requirements from the policy side, we need to align in terms of uh, uh, knowledge support. And the third uh, uh, and last uh, uh, concrete domain where uh, uh, we need to improve is definitely about uh, timeliness of information. And I think uh, we all know that uh, for the past 20, 25 years in Europe, uh, we have been suffering compared to other environmental domains in the biodiversity domain in particular, uh, uh, of uh, the very, very time gaps between uh, uh, different surveys, different uh, uh, information uh, and observation uh, uh, exercises. And this timeliness today uh, is something that we need to bring back into sort of uh, shortening uh, uh, the, the, the way we can indeed uh, report uh, 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 to the policy making in terms of uh, uh, this is really the latest information we can have and this is really indicating the trend lines that we need uh, uh, towards some uh, trajectories towards uh, uh, different targets. So timeliness is really something that we will have to work very hard on to improve. And that comes with the fact that uh, timeliness is also about uh, future. 
And one domain where we have been very, very poor in the biodiversity information is about uh, uh, input data to some form of uh, foresight analysis, uh, to some form of modeling, some form of scenarios. And when it comes to biodiversity outlooks for Europe, uh, this is where we need to really uh, to have uh, uh, further capacities and uh, uh, better input data to sort of uh, uh, meet uh, the uh, distance to target analysis, for instance, uh, discussions that will be required by the biodiversity strategy. So that's just to illustrate uh, 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 where we have the main challenges as requested by the biodiversity strategy. Those are not just uh, the outcome of uh, further reflections on what we do right now. No, those are very precise requirements from the biodiversity strategy. And this is where I would like to leave it, that we need to indeed uh, align uh, knowledge uh, developments completely on uh, the requirements as uh, structured and uh, identified in the strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, time is running short now, but we want to go to the questions. Before taking the questions, a selection of the questions submitted by the participants, I just wonder if any member of the panel has a burning quick observation or comment to the interventions just made. If that's the case, please signal it. If Because if it won't be the case, I would suggest that Giovanni follows up with the first question from the... the from the participants. Back to you, Giovanni. Giovanni, are you there? No, oh, I'm here. Just, uh, I just want to know whether we can collect some questions from the audience. So maybe Grégoire can, can come with the very first question because I think it's useful for me to read it again. Do you have some questions yourself, Grégoire? Can you collect it? Giovanni, I think Grégoire is muted, but I do see one question that I would suggest that Marc Labadi could wish to answer for us because it addresses industrial stakeholders. The question from the audience was how industrial stakeholders could be involved in work at the centre, especially those stakeholders that are involved in the international industry research projects. So we know the industry is willing to share knowledge, experience and data. How can that be done? Mark, do you want to, to give a quick reply, please? Thank you very much. To, to be very quick, I think it, two proposals. Maybe if the Center for Knowledge on Biodiversity could have a, a board of advisors and you can put two or three people coming from the industrial sector and also financial sector, I think, to be part of it with all the stakeholders. And maybe the second proposal, Umberto, you know, you have, you support the European platform for business and biodiversity. And I think it could be a link between the private sector, the industrial sector and the center for knowledge. And the platform can be allowed to address some question, some uh, uh, fields of research to the center once a year, two or three questions, and maybe it could be useful to use this platform to be, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, something like a moderator between the industrial sector and uh, your new center knowledge on biodiversity. Very much, Mark, for reminding us of the potential of linking the business and biodiversity platform with work of this center. In terms of other questions, there was one, if you agree, Giovanni, which was asking, where it was saying that we know what to do on farmland to redress the loss of biodiversity, but how can we go into practice? Uh, maybe Ronan will wish to compliment me because I don't resist on saying just a couple of words myself, which is, we certainly can't do it through hammering the head of farmers. And also many farmers are already doing it. So let's not forget it. So it's on showing how nature can provide some solutions that can replace industrial inputs, chemical inputs that cost money and have other consequences, and also ensuring a livelihood and proper 
proper income for farmers that through these approaches that we can get there. Easier said than done, I know. Ronan, do you want to add a couple of sentences on this, please? Thank you, Beto, and I think you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, everything we have been trying indeed to help uh, 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 DG Agriculture in terms of uh, biodiversity, environment-related uh, indicators uh, 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 is today uh, uh, finding actually a, 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 a policy reality. Not later than yesterday, uh, 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 the Council uh, adopted the farm to fork strategy, uh, which is uh, a, a kind of revision of uh, the common agricultural policy, putting an emphasis on uh, the role of uh, policy indicators, and uh, uh, in particular, when it comes to uh, biodiversity, proposing a new scheme, an eco scheme, that will be uh, uh, piloted uh, uh, through uh, uh, a practical measure on the ground. So I think uh, now we have uh, uh, a door completely open uh, to put in practice uh, what we have been developing as uh, relevant indicators to monitor uh, uh, not only effects, but also potentially uh, uh, the support of uh, some farming practices uh, to uh, uh, revitalizing biodiversity. So I think uh, the new policy context now is much in favor of uh, doing real work on uh, real grounds. Rona, I, I wonder, Giovanni, if you had access to the questions, there was another one that I think would be nice for John Bell. Do you have it yourself, Giovanni, or should I? Yeah, John, I think that they, they say you know, the center is very much appreciated, but can you anticipate the collaboration with, for example, the Horizon Europe Partnership on Biodiversity Research and Monitoring? So, John, how do you see the, the, the link and the complementarity and the, for the collaboration among North Center and the Horizon Europe. John, can you hear me? If not, then, Umberto, do you agree? Maybe you can start it, then I... I also work with you to answer to the next question, which is how the Knowledge Center will collaborate with elements already put in place, contribute to the same hand. So the national, regional institution already working on biodiversity. So how do we see the, the link and collaboration with the national organization, national entities? I'm not sure uh, who are you addressing the question to? I was addressing you and me. <laughs> Giovanni, we are short of time. I suggest you reply yourself and then we go to our concluding remarks, okay? So from, from my side, it's very simple. Again, we will set up the working groups and they are, I think, that the already existing organization, national, regional level, they can participate. So we will see how to organize in working groups on different items. So whoever is interested in agroecology or in other species, we will try to set up working groups that they compass the key scientists you know, in Europe and possibly worldwide. They can provide contribution to the different reports to be issued. But again, the, 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 the very first kick of meeting, which has to be organized within the next three months, will be the moment where we will put on the table all these organize, organizational aspects. Okay, so this is my, so in, in theory, uh, we open to all external stakeholders that they want to take part, you know, but we will need, in case that there are too many, of course, we will need to select in a way or another. Otherwise, of course, we will be too, too broad. But again, this will be the matter for the very first kick-up meeting with Umberto and myself, we try to organize as soon as possible. And Gregoire has the, the clear action to do it. Thank you. Giovanni and all colleagues, I would suggest that we need to skip for the questions for the sake of time management. 
So, uh, as concluding remarks, do you want to follow up with your own concluding remarks, Giovanni, and then you pass me the floor for my own, and we finish afterwards? Uh, I'll be very, very brief, because again, for me, it was a very successful meeting. I saw that there is a very clear consensus on the necessity and the usefulness for this knowledge center as a kind of new entry point for all the people that they really want to work in this domain and they nearly need to be acquainted about the last progress within the commission and within the scientific community. So the bridge between scientific community, fundings, new issues, and the key decision makers is very well perceived by all. So there is the need for participation of big organizations, as I said, the EA, the, the CPD, the United Nations Environmental Protection, and maybe others. But again, the, the, for me, the, the key input today is that there is an unanimous consensus now that this is something necessary, the right time to do it. Now, it's very important how it will be done and, and the success is in the implementation. So. I really look forward, together with you, Umberto, and all the other stakeholders, you know, to make this long story ahead a really success story, because we, we absolutely have a challenge, but the, the, thing, the issue is complex, therefore we need to be all together and collaborate in a very effective way. So thanks a lot for the collaboration, for the participation to this half a day meeting, which was, again, very well supported by policy representation but also from the scientific community. Thank you again and again my thank also to you Umberto for the from the very beginning your full support to this idea and again engagement also for your staff. Thank you very much Umberto thanks to all the participants, the speakers and invited guests. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Giovanni. We owe it also to you, Gregoire, and so many colleagues that contributed. So uh, other than uh, also thanking all participants and the audience for what I think was a very inspiring session, including session one. I would just say the following. Uh, knowledge is per se not a sufficient condition to ensure the required transformative change. Or if I can put it otherwise, facts alone are not enough for people to change, to change their worldviews, their practices, their attitudes. But it is certainly a necessary condition. Of course, we need to have the facts and then the perception of facts as real. And for this, we also need some emotions. But I think we have well understood in this session how crucial knowledge will be to change the paradigm, both within the EU and globally. And I do trust a lot and have a lot of hope and uh, honor to see this center uh, starting right now. So it's now time again, to look seriously into the EU Green Deal and into the EU Biodiversity Strategy 2030, which some have said, and I also have that view, it's probably one of the most ambitious strategies the world has ever seen on biodiversity, because the facts say that's what is required. So thanks again to all, uh, goodbye, and thanks for the team that has worked so hard. For my part, this is all. Bye-bye. Many thanks to all of you. So you, Carla, thanks to all of you. Thank you.